cameras for anyone else. Please, um, please do feel free to turn on your cameras so that our speakers can see who they're talking to. All right, do you wanna get started? Norval, is that good with you? Can we you go. Sounds good. Um, okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm Debbie Chang. I am the Director of Fellowships and Public Service Partnerships at the Colin Powell School. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event on Attica. We are so, so fortunate to be joined today by Stanley Nelson, the foremost documentarian of the African-American experience and a 1976 alum of City College, whose latest film chronicles the Attica Rebellion, which was the largest and deadliest prison uprising in US history. Um, and it took place 50 years ago in upstate New York. He'll be in conversation with Professor Heather Thompson, a historian at the University of Michigan, whose book, Blood in the Water, the Attica Prison Uprising of 1971, won the Pulitzer Prize and many other awards. And the discussion will be moderated by Norval Solane, the director of the Urban Mentoring and Achievement Network, or UMAN, which is part of the CUNY Blackmail Initiative. Before I introduce Norval, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the loss of General Colin Powell, for whom our school is named and who has enabled us to provide so many educational and leadership opportunities for our students. Some of you may remember that it was only three short weeks ago that the Colin Powell School held its last public event, a heartfelt conversation between General Powell and his daughter, Linda, in which he shared fond memories about growing up in the South Bronx to immigrant parents, attending City College and finding himself at ROTC, his trailblazing career as the first African-American uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of State, and giving back to CCNY through the establishment of the Colin Powell Center, which is now the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership. We are forever indebted to General Powell for his leadership and generosity, particularly for enabling our students to work on pressing public problems through fellowships and paid internships, creating the next generation of leaders right here in the hallowed halls of City College. So this event with Stanley Nelson and Heather Thompson is indeed part of the Racial Justice Fellows Program, which is now in its second year, and which we created in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the ensuing protests. Through this Racial Justice Fellows Program, which is a partnership between the Colin Powell School and CCNY's Black Studies Program, we hope to empower our students to become leaders in this space, whether they approach racial justice through film and the arts, through history and academia, through politics or policy, or through grassroots social movements. And General Powell was very much uh, in support of the creation of this fellowship. He was critical in raising initial funding from the Carnegie Corporation to provide our fellows with internship stipends for this work. So his legacy lives on through this very program. It's also so fitting to be discussing Attica and, and the profound contributions that our panelists have made toward helping us understand uh, the events that took place 50 years ago when we're still in the midst of similar challenges today at Rikers and elsewhere. So I am personally so excited for this conversation and I wanna thank our co-sponsors for helping us to make this event happen. Uh, the Department of Media and Communication Arts, the Documentary Forum, Third World Newsreel and UMAN. So let me turn this over to Norval Swalane, director of UMAN, who also wears many hats here at CCNY, including as coordinator of the Harcourt Scholarship Program, as an admission specialist, and as a professor of a course called African Heritage and the Caribbean Brazilian Experience, which is in the Black Studies Program. Norval is also a proud CCNY graduate, having received his BA in history here before getting a master's in liberal studies from Fordham. And he'll be moderating the, moderating the conversation for the first 50 minutes or so before we open it up to audience questions. So we encourage you to use the chat to type your questions um, since there will be time for Stanley and Heather to address them after this initial conversation. Please also note that we are recording this event and we will be posting it on the Colin Powell School YouTube channel. So with that, Norval, please take it away. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we're so happy to have Stanley and Heather with us today. Uh, by way of introduction, I just want to say a few words about their accomplishments. Um, certainly, if I read all of the, their accomplishments, we wouldn't have time for anything else. But uh, we're, again, so happy to have them. Stanley Nelson is a prolific documentary filmmaker, 
uh, who is a multiple Emmy Award winner and a MacArthur Genius Fellow. He has received an individual Peabody Award, the 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, and received the National Medal in the Humanities from President Barack Obama. He is among the premier documentary filmmakers working today. And his latest film, as we've mentioned, Attica, had its American premiere at the Apollo Theater last week. It will be a, a begin regular screening at Cinema City on October 29th, and it will have its broadcast premiere on November 6th on Showtime. And we're proud to say that, the, again, repeat that he is a, an alumnus of the City College of New York and that his mother was a librarian at City and his sister also taught English at City. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Heather Ann Thompson is a historian at the University of Michigan and is the Pulitzer Prize and Bancroft Prize winning author of Blood in the Water, as Debbie showed you, um, the Attica Prison Uprising in 1971 and its legacy, which was published by Pantheon Books in 2016. Blood in the Water has received many additional book awards and Dr. Thompson served as the lead historical consultant for the film. And, and uh, she has been the go-to consultant for film projects about crime and punishment in America and about Attica in particular. She serves on several panels, advisory boards and committees that study policing and the causes and consequences of mass incarceration in the US. And she was recently awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship to write her next book, on the move bombing in Philadelphia of 1985. And she uh, currently serves as president of the Urban History Association. Again, we thank both of them for joining us and we are so excited to have the both of them with us. Um, what we'd like to do for the next hour or so is frame the event that was the Attica prison uprising. We'll take a look at a trailer from the film in a moment and we'll talk about the process of documenting history through film and writing and we'll consider what Attica means in the broader pro aspect of the American social structure and in the world in general. And, and I hope that can, we can take some questions from the audience, uh, who I also want to thank for joining us today, especially um, the, some of the students who are in my class. Um, so in speaking to folks about this uh, conversation today, the reactions I've received have ranged from references from the scene uh, or references to the scene in the film Dog Day Afternoon, where Al Pacino starts chanting, Attica, Attica, right? To the line in the song, If I Rule the World, Imagine That by Nas, where he says, I'd open every cell in Attica, send him to Africa. But even people who remember Attica being in the news don't seem to have a grasp of the details or of the magnitude of what occurred there. Um, so briefly, and obviously without having to issue spoiler alerts for the film or, or the book, um, what was Attica? Stanley, could you start us off with that? Sure. Uh, I'm sorry that, that the uh, police are, are just happened to be driving by my house at this moment. That might be appropriate. Yeah. Oh, I, I also just want to make a correction. So the, the film actually, the theater is called the Cinema Village. I'm sorry. So the Cinema Village down on, on East 12th Street and it's next uh, Friday, the uh, 29th uh, of October, it opens. And um, I and uh, the uh, co-director Tracy Curry uh, will be there Friday and Saturday night to uh, introduce the film and do question and answer after the film. Okay, so what was Attica? Probably probably Heather would be better off giving the, 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 the quick comment, but, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, September uh, of uh, 1971, the uh, prisoners in Attica uh, took over the prison and, and um, they took hostages, uh, guards and civilian workers at the prison hostage and um, held, held the prison for five days. Um, it was a huge major news event um, in this country and around the world. Um, because it, it was the biggest prison uprising that had ever been. And it went on for, you know, um, five days in the news. Heather, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. I mean, really, it was one of the most extraordinary, I would say, human rights, civil rights uh, protests in U.S. history behind bars. You know, 1,300 men 
standing together for the, the basic principle that just because you are doing time, you don't check your human rights at the door and uh, standing together for, you know, the, the right to have decent food, the, the right to have decent medical care, uh, and the right to be recognized as human. And um, for those, as Stanley says, those four long days and four long nights, uh, the world looked on, the media was there, the observers that they had called in were there. And uh, there was this extraordinary experiment in participatory democracy. These men elected people to uh, represent them out of each of the cell blocks and they negotiated with the state for those four long days and four nights for these basic rights. And it was uh, something that the world watched with enormous anticipation that something uh, really productive might come out of it to humanize uh, conditions of confinement, uh, not just for Attica, but potentially for institutions across this country. Uh, and it was at a moment when uh, people felt that this was not only possible, but that real progress was in fact being made. Uh, but a lot of other people were deeply, deeply threatened by that possibility. And, and thus the, the conflict that Stanley and Tracy's film sets up uh, so, so beautifully uh, that you will all get to see. And, and in a few minutes, we're, we're going to share a trailer from the film. Um, uh, and while we're setting that up, why, why Heather, did you uh, feel moved to uh, research and write a book about, uh, about this event? Well, you know, as just as Stanley captures these uh, extraordinary stories of, of, you know, the struggle, you know, on film, I, I try to do the same uh, on the page. And there is something so extraordinary about the fact that people with virtually or seemingly no power took on the most powerful, uh, uh, arguably the most powerful state uh, in this country. And I was just so struck by that. And, and also so struck, as you said, by how is it that we could still 50 years later or at the time I began writing it, you know, 30 years later, know so little about it. And I, and I wanted to kind of probe that. And I think Stanley, you know, felt you know, not to put words in your mouth, Stanley, but I think the same kind of thing, like how, what happened here? And how could this, how could this have been so important and yet how could people have so single-handedly tried to erase it? And, and I, we, I think we both felt, right, that we just wanted to let the brothers tell their story in the way that we each help people, I think, to tell their stories. And Stanley, aside from the 50th anniversary, although perhaps that wasn't a consideration, what, what, was, uh, the, what was the motivation for making the film? Well, you know, I had wanted to make the film for a long time. I had been thinking about Attica, you know, for, for 20, 30 years about, about trying to make a film about Attica. I, I think that, that things just fell into place. You know, one, you know, in, in my career where, you know, I, I could dictate more uh, what I could do. And so that, you know, I could do more of what I wanted to do. And so I really wanted to do this film. Um, I think that that also, you know, was kind of pressing because, you know, it, it was coming on 50 years ago and, and you figure that 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 the guys in the yard, the prisoners, former prisoners, you know, they were 20, 25 years old, maybe some of them, and, and that they were 70, 75 and that, you know, that, you know, I've done a lot of historical films and, and to me that's still, you know, that's still golden, you know, you're, you're, you're young when, when you're 70, 75, you know, you're, you have, you know, good memories, but, but, you know, it's, it's not gonna, you know, 85, 90 is, is, is a very different thing. So um, I felt that, that it was the, the right time, you know, because of the age of, of people. Um, you know, and, and I mean, really, it, it was an evergreen story. It's not like, you know, um, the, the story we could have done, the, we couldn't have done the story 20 years ago. We could, can't do the story, you know, it's not as just as important 10 years from now. Um, but it was just the right time in, in so many ways to do it. And, and you know, it's always the, the kind of the right time to talk about, at least so far, about prison reform. You know what's happening at Attica. I mean, I'm sorry. What's happening at Rikers? You know, makes Attica just so much more relevant. You know, but but that that's almost any time. You know, because because of the of the prison system in the, in the United States, which is is just so you know awful. 
but we're going to uh, we're going to come uh, look at a trailer uh, now, a trailer for the film, and then we're going to come back and and uh, talk about the process of of making a film like this and of writing a book like this. So, um, Ricardo, if you could take it away. Attica was f fear. There was 70% black and brown prisoners, all white guards. What could go wrong? Grab the guards, grab the keys. All hell broke loose. Tell me this, are these primarily blacks? Guys were complaining about the basic things like toothpaste. A roll of toilet paper would last you a month. The inmates were considered like animals. They beat you up in your cell, and then they take your segregation, and sometimes you don't come back. Have the inmates made any demands? There are all kinds of demands for change in the whole world. This had to be mediated, otherwise it was going to end in disaster. They wanted to use those weapons. Put your hands in the air, and you will not be harmed. You will not be harmed. You will not be harmed. But that was bullshit. They want to kill us. We are men. He was waking up America. Somebody had to take a stand. I was I was very uh, fortunate to have been at the, um, the premiere last week of the Apollo. Um, very moving, uh, emotionally evocative film, uh, and uh, want to thank and 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 the book. There are sections of the book, one of the book that were just hard to get through, and I had to put it down every every few sentences sometimes because just you know it was just really hard to get through in the description of of what happened. But I, I want to talk about the process, if I may, of of going about. Uh, deciding to write a book like this and to make a film like this, could you? Could we start talking about that? How do you how do you go about making that decision, and 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 how do you go about starting on a project like this, Heather? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think back on it, and I, of course, I didn't have a clue in retrospect what this process was going to be. I had written a book about Detroit, which was also very painful to write. This is where I'm from, and. And this is the city I grew up in, and and I, it had a it had a lot of pain at its core as well. And yet I didn't even imagine, I couldn't even begin to imagine what the journey of writing this book was about. And every single person that uh, I had the honor to meet writing it and to kind of try to be a, a you know a conduit for their stories. There wasn't a person that I spoke to that did not break down, no matter how they were touched by this story. There was not a human being that was a part of this history that was not permanently damaged at some level. And, and, and to know even how to, 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 to write a story like this, we're not trained at some level how to do that. Um, and so it was a journey. And um, a very long journey in my case, 13 years, because of course the state of New York had, had had and continues to obfuscate all the records. So in my case, it really relied on the survivors to introduce me to the next person and the next person and the next person and to find documents hidden places and and under, you know, in places that you would never imagine them to be to kind of reconstruct exactly what had happened. And, um, and so I think back on that process and um, think, good Lord, if I would have known, maybe I never <laughs> would have dared to even try it. And I am grateful for the people who shared that trauma because had they not, um, I, I couldn't have done it to be, to be frank with you. Um, we are dependent on people uh, to refuse to allow themselves to be silenced, to tell the stories that we do. And that is just the bottom line. Uh, we are, we are, we, it is, it is, uh, it is our, it, it is their, their ability to walk through this again and again and again that allows us to do this. And that's just the truth. 
Thank you. Uh, I must, I can't, can't imagine um, what you what you experienced as you did that. Stanley, I'll ask you the same question. How do you go about deciding to make a film about this particular topic? Um, what, what was your motivation? I mean, there, there, were, there were a number of factors. There was the, uh, the fact that um, there, there still were witnesses and people alive who could talk about it. And, uh, you know, to find them um, and, 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 and to get them uh, to be able to uh, willingly talk about it. I, you know, I have to say that um, in, in some ways, you know, we were at an advantage because, you know, Heather had written a book already, you know, and, um, and so, you know, we were, we're talking to Heather um, and, and, you know, just really finding witnesses at the same time, you know, as a filmmaker, one of the things that motivated me to make the film is I knew that there was footage of, of Attica. You know, I, I had seen, you know, footage of Attica, you know, um, you know, in the news at the time, you know, in some films that were done, you know, 30, 40, almost 50 years ago. You know, I, I so I, I kind of, we kind of knew that there was some, some footage. Uh, we had no idea, you know, the, the amount of footage that, that we would find, but, but we knew that there was some things there. So really, you know, it, it's a process of, you know, for a filmmaker of, okay, you know, we've got, we've got witnesses that can tell the story. Um, we've got footage that can help tell the story. And then it, it's a matter of, 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 of raising money um, because, you know, the, one of the big differences is, is between you know making a film and writing a book and and, and I, I don't want to be little writing a book but you know you can sit down at your computer and write a book you know and and you know and, and you know you can use your phone or you know talk to people and meet people but for a film you need money you know and, and so finally you know we, we we had to had to raise money and and luckily we got we got a little bit of money and we put together you know what, what what's called a teaser or a trailer or a sizzle reel whatever you want to call it and you know that was an eight minute reel that we we did like maybe three or four interviews um, and, um, and we put them together with some footage um, and, and then kind of shopped it around. Um, and then and we struck a deal with Showtime uh, to produce the film. Now you talk about the footage that was available. The, the prisoners actually invited news, uh, the news outlets into the prison yard to, to film everything that was happening. And the state police, I believe, also uh, were filming what was going on. Isn't that right? Is that why there was so much footage available? Yeah, I mean that that that's one of the reasons. I you know that that that's that's the biggest reason. I, that that's one of the the amazing things um, that the prisoners did was you know the first day they they invited uh, the news media in. They invited cameras in. They thought that uh, you know they wanted the the process to be transparent. They thought that 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 if 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 they were being filmed, there was a certain amount of protection if, if, the, uh, if the cameras came in. And then also this was the, the very beginning of, of home video. So um, the New York State was, was up in the towers with this kind of really rudimentary camera, a black and white camera that, that, would, that shot video. Um, and they were shooting the whole time almost. You know, they were just shooting up at that, in, in that tower. And, and the one amazing thing that we found is that that they left the mics open. I, I don't know if they didn't know how to turn the mic off or if they didn't know the mic was on, but you hear them talking through the whole thing and you know, describing the prisoners, you know. Um, at one point, they actually take the sight off, off a rifle, you know, um, and you put it up in front of the lens so that it, it becomes a telephoto lens, but it becomes a telephoto lens with crosshairs. So, you know, it's just chilling footage because they're, they're panning around the yard and, and they have the, uh, the uh, prisoners in their sights with crosshairs in their sights and, and it's just amazing footage. So one of the most amazing things was the footage that existed. Also for any, you know, any film geeks, you know, the, the other thing about it was that they were still, the, the, the networks were still shooting 16 millimeter. So, you know, it, it, looks, it looks incredible when we went back to the networks to the original 16 millimeter film whenever we could and um, because you know film doesn't deteriorate in the same way that videotape does so the film just looks i mean it's it's crystal clear you know it's it's film you know and and, and that that also you know is part of um what the film attica you know represents 
And, and also, Heather, yeah, go ahead, Heather. Well, I was just going to add the other kind of extraordinary thing, the, the, the footage that that this film is able to bring to bear. I mean, I was just just so, so blown away when I was able to see the the, the first, you know, the fine cut. It just, it's just incredible. I mean, stuff that I thought I'd seen almost any, <laughs> everything there was to see. And I was just, just blown away by what, what they were able to recover. And there is an actual story that is so kind of heart rendering about even some of these photographs that you'll see in the film, which is that the brothers themselves, it was their fight for justice over so many decades that we even have so many of the photographs that you're, you're able to see. These state troopers, the, the, these, you know, these kind of horrendous torture films that, you know, uh, uh, photographs that you're able to see, they documented the horrors that they committed. They documented them, I mean, much like the lynching photographs, you know, of, of, of you know, so, so, so many decades, right? They, they, they take these photographs and then they deny their existence. They deny their existence for, for just so, so long. But the brothers don't accept this. And they say, you know, no, you will not sweep what happened to us under the rug. You will not deny this orgy of violence that has happened to us. And for decades, they push back, right? This is all these, these, these battles that go on after this event happens. And though the film is not about that, the film honors that because you see these photographs. And we have these photographs because years later, the brothers insist on being heard in these civil trials where these photographs will come out. And the state is forced essentially to, to you know, their misdeeds are on display. You see what they have done in these photographs because, because they took pictures of it, because they documented it and they documented it with with impunity, with 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 glee, and uh, and it is really something extraordinary um, because because Stanley and Tracy do this so so powerfully in the film. You get to see what what they what they did, what they, what they documented. It's really incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that you know, as Heather was saying, I mean, one of the, the things of, uh, about the film is, is that you know we see we see everything. You know, we don't we don't have we we don't just talk about it. You know, the prisoners and and the and and the hostage families and and uh, the observers and the national guard we have in the film. They not not only just talk about it. We see it. I mean, be, because you know it's all on video or 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 in still pictures. And, and so that's one of the things that's so striking and and harrowing and and, and devastating uh, about the film. You know, because it, it, it's all there. You know, we see it. In, in researching the book, Heather, it, it looks like you, in addition to the film and the pho photographs, it looks like you came across some interesting um, um, kinds of uh, evidence, if you will, um, that was warehoused um, that, that you were surprised to come across. Could you talk about some of those items, um, particularly clothing and, and other documents? Yeah, you know, one of the one of the things that happens in the retaking that you'll you'll see in the film that you know the devastating moment when you know it is possible to settle this peacefully. It is possible to uh, to to bring about some something positive in this uprising, and instead these these troopers come in with guns blazing, and it's a massacre. In the in the end of this they go the troopers then go through and they begin scooping up all of the uh evidence of their uh misdeeds and uh instead of collecting what they should have done which is the evidence of their misdeeds they in fact uh bury all that destroy that evidence uh uh you know basically literally a cover-up begins but what they do is they also collect things to make the prisoners look like this is all down to them, right? They, they accuse the prisoners of having killed the hostages. It's a whole horrible thing that happens after the uprising. And 30 years later, the, some of this evidence surfaces and, and I was able to just see some of the stuff and, um, and it, is, it is really horrible. It is just horrific. And some of this, some of this, evidence, you know, I end up holding and feeling and some of the, you just see that the, some of this is, I describe it in the book, 
you get to see some of these photographs again that 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 Abel is then put into the film. But what is never what is never acknowledged is the fact that behind all of this, it's actually not the troopers. It's not the the guys on the ground committing this harm. It's the fact that it's the guys in the suits. It's the guys in Rockefeller's living room. Uh, it's the guys with the martinis and the, you know, in the fanciest offices making all these decisions. And I was able, thank God, to find their documents indicating that they had no intention of settling this peacefully. They had no intention of doing anything other than what happened. It is brutal. Uh, the documents that no one wanted us to see just reveal that this was, uh, as, as Stanley's beautiful footage shows of Nixon, this was about making sure that these men, these powerless men, these overwhelmingly black and brown men were not going to be able to stand up and be treated as human. And certainly we're not going to take the state of New York down. Uh, and at any means, you know, at, at any cost, they were going to be uh, put in their place. And that's what those documents uh, revealed that, that I was able to see, uh, not because they were turned over to the state of New York's citizens, uh, as they should have been, but by complete happenstance, by complete accident, because I, I just found them. And, and some of those men um, were, um, um, they were the, uh, I think, most important part of, of the film. Stanley, you- uh, um, He found them, it was incredible. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> he, that- He got them to talk. <laughs> there are other films about Attica. I don't think that there nope. is, this is one that where the surviving uh, the, you know, brothers got a chance to speak about the experience um, to, to any great extent. Would that be correct, Stanley? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I you know, so, some some people have spoken before, but uh, so many people in the film have have never really spoken before, and 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 you know that that's what we knew, and that's what we wanted. You know, we, we again we figured, you know, look, there's about a thousand people in the yard. You know, there's got to be people. You know, you know, black, white, Latinx. You know, who haven't spoken before. You know, we can we have to be able to find people, and, and um, you know, we we did, and and you know. Uh, Thanks, you know, uh, to Heather and, and and also, you know, um, we're working with uh, also a, a consultant, uh, Judy Clark, you know, who works with prisoners' rights and and uh, you know, look her up, you know, but she has you know more credibility than than anybody on earth, you know, and and and, and Judy, you know, help you know talk to people and and uh, you know, we 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 done a, a number of historical films. And, and um, you know, this is, I think in some ways, uh, the, the survivors were, were closest to a film that we did about Jonestown and Jim Jones and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the people who, had, who survived that. And, and, you know, what we said then and what we said with Attica was that, you know, we'll talk to people and we'll lay out what we're doing. And, you know, we'll find out if they want to be interviewed. And if they say no, we'll go with that. You know, we won't try to convince them. You know, we won't, you know, say those things that producers say and are good at, you know, it's part of our job, you know. Oh, it'll really help you to talk about it. Oh, you really need to talk about it. You know, it'll be good for you because sometimes it's not good for them. And, and you know, so we, we said, you know, we'll, we'll lay out what we're doing and we'll lay it out honestly. And if, if you guys want to, talk to us you know we, we'd, be, we'd be glad to have you and and, and that's what we did and, and fortunately you know we got an incredible core group of people um you know who are great I mean there's they're so different they're so unique you know you, you just you know just by telling their story you get an idea of who they are as people um you know their faces you know the, you know you never forget their faces um you know they're they're, they're just an, an incredible uh, group of people and I have to say you know, that, that Tracy Curry, you know, the co my co-director, you know, who did all the interviews and, and a lot of the, the research and getting people, um, you know, she's just, you know, fantastic uh, producer director and, and uh, you know, just has that personality that, you, you know, you want to, I you think know, the, you want to talk to her. The, I yeah. think the only, uh, it, it appeared that the only constituency that was not represented in, in being interviewed for the film were members, the surviving members of the law enforcement of the state police and the and the uh, the prison guards. There, there were there were members of the um, hostages, families, uh, government officials. What 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 is that? Uh, what why was that? Could you speak to why? Yeah, we we, we had. Um... 
we had arranged to, to interview like three or four guards um, and some of their wives. Um, and, um, you know, they, they backed out at, at the very last moment, you know. I mean, I have to say, you know, they, they all live in, they were all living somewhere like in Clearwater, Florida, you know, that kind of place. And, uh, um, you know, they, they said, oh, well, we, we looked up, we looked up Stanley Nelson on, on the, on, on the web and we know what kind of film Stanley Nelson does. And so, you know, we don't, we don't want to talk. Um, and we, you know, we tried to convince them, you know, we tried to talk to them some more about it, you know, and that, you know, we want to hear their side of the story. But they're out of it. They didn't want to be in it. And that, that's fine. You know, in, in some ways, um, you know, I, I, I'm super fine with that because if, 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 if we had, if we had interviewed them, you know, what would they say? You know, oh, prison conditions weren't so bad. Oh, we never beat anybody. Oh, you know, people had enough toilet paper. Oh, you know, I mean, so, and, and then we would have to spend time refuting that, you know, um, when, when you see the film, you have no doubt for one moment that what the prisoners are telling you is true. And I will say, you know, and, and it, it actually, they do have, uh, you know, they have Dee Quinn Miller is a very central voice in this film. And she is the daughter of the correction officer who was a real central figure in the story and, and another guard, actually two other guard families. And, um, and what was an extraordinary thing to me in this film was that they also had uh, Michael Whiteman, who was uh, one of Rockefeller, uh, one of, a part of the Rockefeller administration in this film, which I can just tell you personally has never ever spoke, nobody from the Rockefeller administration has ever spoken to anybody with one exception, which was, which was Robert Douglas, who spoke uh, on an American Experience documentary once. But, but that was a very controlled interview. And um, so that was really, uh, I actually felt that, the, that that side was actually represented very well. And that's just me speaking personally. Um, I, I, I thought that it was, the thing that again is so powerful about the film is that not only did the brothers speak more than they've ever spoken, you know, I think really ever on a documentary film, but, the, but it also, the images, as Stanley says, the, 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 the everything else, you are left feeling like you know the story. You, you don't feel at all like there's a, there's a, there's something missing that you need, that you need something else that you didn't get or that, that you're feeling swayed in some way that you didn't understand. And, and the name Rockefeller evokes uh, another issue. Um, Heather, you write about the structural backlash that Attica had in incarceration policies in, in this country. Could you speak about the irony of how that developed? Well, you know, Stanley said in the very beginning, and it's so important that this film is timely. Uh, it, it, in some respect, it could have been done at any time because prisons are always the scourge of our, our nation. On the other hand, it is so timely because uh, you can't even pick up any newspaper now and see the extraordinary crisis we are in right now. You know, more people still in prison than any other country on the planet. And the conditions in particular, you know, we've been in a criminal justice reform moment for a decade now, a bipartisan uh, criminal justice reform moment for a decade now. And in some respect, in terms of conditions, the, the needle hasn't moved at all. Conditions are worse now uh, I would argue than they were in 1971. So why? How can that possibly be? And you, you, and Attica is ground zero of that story. And you begin to understand that it's because, you know, the American people were lied to at Attica. You know, you have these 1,300 men who stand together to say, look at what's going on behind bars. We can, we can do things differently, and, and essentially. The state goes in there and tortures and kills all of these men and then stands out in front of the in front of the prison and says, no, we didn't do anything wrong. The prisoners killed the hostages. The prisoners are the animals. And that goes out on the front page of the New York Times, the front page of the LA Times, every small town newspaper in between. And, and, and we can document the palpable effect that has on this nation's feeling about prisoner rights and about, and, and about you know, any desire to feel charitable about 
people behind bars. It is, it is, you know, Attica is a very important moment in swinging this pendulum rightward and people feeling abandoned, you know, abandoning this idea that people behind bars are people. And it's not the only event, but it's a critical moment here. And so the timeliness of us looking at Attica and remembering what was really happening and kind of getting back in touch with that in a moment when we need to look at Rikers, in a moment when we need to look at the Manhattan House of Detention and you know, this is really, this is where it's at. We were lied to about Attica and listening to the brothers, we are remembering why it's so important to get it, get it right now and, and, and switch gears at 50 years, right? Like, like remedy it, get it right now. And, and if I could just dolly back to use the film term, I guess, um, and take a broader perspective, the, the footage and the photos, especially, of the naked prisoners being marched through the prison yard are uh, astonishing, especially in, in how they're described as being a recollection of people being rounded up for the purpose of enslavement. Stanley, is, is that a fair representation, do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it, it, it's incredible. I mean, I think when, when uh, you know, John Dunn, you know, says that, um, you know that 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 he was reminded of depictions of African Americans being rounded up, you know, into slave ships. It's the perfect line, you know, and it comes at the perfect time in the film because that's what you're thinking, you know, or you're thinking, "Damn, doesn't it remind you?" Know it reminds me, and then he says it, and you're like, "Yeah," you know, it's not just me, right? It's it, it's what it is. Um, it's just it's just amazing. And uh, you know, it has this, I mean, the picture, the pictures also at that point are just incredible, you know, because not only are they incredible for their content, but they're incredibly beautiful. I mean, they're, they're, the photos are great, you know. I mean, like whoever they, you know, this guy, whoever took those pictures was a pro, you know, it's a pro. And and the the photos where you see them nude and sitting down with their hands like this. You know, it's just amazing the, because you, you can see their faces, you know, and, and, and you see, you know, the, the, you know, what they're going through, you know, and, and at that same time, as they're describing that, you know, I, I mean, I love one of the inmates, you know, Arthur Harrison, because, you know, you, you know, you, you can tell from, from his face, he says, you know, I want, I had to make a choice. You know, did I want to die or did I want to live to tell my story? You know, and this is a guy who's in prison. I mean, he was a tough guy. You know, he'll tell you that. You know, and what it took out of him, and what, and you see it fifty years later. You know what they did to those men uh, is just amazing. And again, you know, one of the things as a filmmaker, it's it's there. You know, you see it. You see them and. Um, you know, it's it's um, we were able to tell that story and and tell that story with power, and you know we we we've, we've had four screenings, you know, <laughs> so far, you know that's all we've had. But you know, every screening, you know, the people are talking about those pictures, you know, and the, and there's other you know terrible terrible images, but there's something about that those pictures that just tears your heart out. And one, one of the um, brothers, uh, I forget exactly who it was, said, and I'll, I'll never forget this, uh, probably of all the things that are, that are said in the film, said, you know, I've seen some bad things on the street, but I've never seen anything worse than what, what I saw in that prison yard. And I'm a bad person, but I realized that I was no longer the baddest person in it, that these guys who were shooting us, shooting at us, they were the bad people. And in that context, 50 years later, is there nothing better about prisons and, 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 and systems of incarceration in this country? Is, is there nothing that we can say is, as, as has been reformed or is better? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'll let Heather take, take the main answer. But, but you know, so, you know, they, they complain in, in Attica, you know, before about, you know, getting one roll of toilet paper a month. You know, like, okay, I mean, they, they literally get one roll of toilet paper and that, that roll of toilet paper has to last you a month. 
you know, and there's no way to do that. Okay, so maybe now at prisons, you know, they got enough toilet paper, right? But we have 2 million people incarcerated, right? 2 million people. You know, one of the one of the most beautiful lines, you know, in the film, most memorable lines is when they're outside the first night and one of the guys is just looking up, you know, like like like, you know, and 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 the the guy we interview says like to, to him, what's wrong? And the guy's looking up, says, I haven't seen the night sky in 22 years. Okay. Two million people will not see the night sky tonight. Okay, so balance that against a few more rolls of toilet paper. I think that's right. I mean, and, and I think that in, a, in addition to the sheer number of people, uh, which is uh, unfathomable, and we will indeed look back uh, in, you know, in subsequent generations on this moment and, and, and it will be hard to process what happened and why this happened and, and what this even was because it is so unimaginable what this country has done over the last 50 years in terms of the sheer numbers. But I would, I would say that even in terms of the objective conditions, they are, um, they are much worse despite the laws being better despite the fact that we have protections like Estelle versus Gamble, and we have, despite the, despite the fact that the 60s put in place very, very important prisoner rights protections, the reality on the ground is that, uh, you know, women are shackled at birth. We have horrendous medical care. The, the COVID deaths, the, 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 the treatment of children, the number of people serving life sentences, the number of hours people do in solitary confinement, the number of deaths in custody, the number of beat downs, the number of sheer, uh, the sheer abuse that goes on behind bars. It is, it is unconscionable the way we treat human beings, men, women, and children. We have more children living in these conditions than any other country. And, um, and, and that is something that is allowed to happen on our dime. Uh, we pay for it. These are mostly state prisons, private prisons. They're a problem, sure, but it's a minuscule percentage of the prisons. We pay for them. It is in our name. And they go on because we don't know, uh, you know, because, because stories like Attica get hidden and shunted away and because people get to lie about them. And that's why I think uh, letting the brothers uh, in this film speak as they do is so, so important and going to see this film is so important and, 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 and telling, you know, doing 500 films like this and books and, and, and because because this couldn't happen if people actually, if all these all, all these places were transparent cubes and you had to walk by them every day, nobody with conscience could uh, could let this go on. Right, but but I, I also should say that you know, in, in so many ways, you know, prisons are 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 doing what they're supposed to do. Well, exactly. That's they put, exactly. They, they put people away. They put people away. You know, far away from us. Two hundred fifty miles. Attic is two hundred fifty miles from New York City, middle of nowhere. They put them away. We don't have to look at them. We don't have to think about them. And that's what that's what prisons are, are meant to do. And and um, you know, it, it's it's horrendous. Anthony, uh, you you mentioned earlier. We someone mentioned earlier uh, Rikers and and the, the situation that um, whatever that is, because I always get the feelings like we don't we don't always get all of the information um, that we should probably have. Uh, about what's going on in a place like Rikers, um, is uh, is that an example of what you're talking about? Is is it really? Do, do we do we think that it's something that we should really um, uh, connect, make a direct connection uh, to Attica at all? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean. Whatever you're being told about what happened, every death, every event, you know, whether it's someone that you've heard the name like Khalif Browder or whether it's the thousands of names that you've never heard, 
when, when any, any time a Department of Corrections official stands out in front of the news cameras and tells you what happened, what Attica shows you is that you must always corroborate six ways till Sunday what you were just told. Attica tells you to never, ever, ever believe what the Department of Corrections has just told you just went down inside of those four walls. And, and that, that's a, that leads me to the last question. And I think that if we could wrap it up for, for you know, to continue on that thought, for all of us listening right now who are, who are logged into to, to this and, and listening, and uh, what does Attica mean today for us? What, if we can um, put it in that context, what, what should we take away from this? Um, what does it mean for us as, as those of us who are, you know, sitting comfortably in our homes and, and you know, going about our daily life and being able to see the stars at night. What, what, what should Attica mean for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Heather have the last word, but I think, I think you know, for the film, it, mean, it means so many things, you know? In, in the film, you know, we see what I call the casual racism that exists from top to bottom, you know? And, and that's really important that, that we understand that, you know, from the guards uh, to, to Richard Nixon, you know, who, who, who congratulates uh, Governor Rockefeller on a job well done. And his first words, you know, was it the Blacks? Was it the Blacks who were, who were responsible for taking over the prison? That's, that's the president uh, of, of the United States. Um, you know, and, and again, I think that, that, that we have to think about, um, you know, how and why we ended up with two, two million people in prison. Right. But also, you know, we, we, we have to also think about how these guys got there, you know, that 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 their lives from the moment they were born, w w their lives were focused almost entirely on getting them incarcerated. And, and, and it was very successful. You know, they, they were, you know, they're incarcerated, you know. So um, I think all of those things, you know, um, we think about, um, you know, once we see the film. I think that's right. I mean, I think that the, the you, this film just underscores the, 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 the way in which racism is baked into the DNA of this country. The, 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 the film is the, uh, what, the crescendo of it. It's the explosion of it. It's the, it's the, it, it is the um, dramatic expression of it. But as Stanley says, at every step along the way, it, 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 you know, it's all, it, it's about it at every stage and, it, and it's a reckoning with it and it's a sobering reckoning with it. And I think that's all, that's exactly right. And I guess the only thing that I think that the Attica brothers in the film also make us have as a takeaway is that we wouldn't be able to do the book, the film, we wouldn't be able to do any of it if there was not the other flip side of that, which is that they also refuse, <laughs> refuse to be silenced, even despite that. And, you know, they have this saying, uh, which is that Attica is all of us. And they just, you know, they said it in 1971 and they say it today, like they can't, they constantly say it, Attica is all of us, Attica is all of us. And to them, that means that, you know, we can't, we can't let Attica die. We have to remember that it's, it's still here and, and it's, the, it's the kind of the rallying cry to not let this be what it's like forever. And I always kind of try to remember that part of it too, that it, it's the example of what can happen when 1300 people can come together and refuse to be silenced or shut down or, or you know, they're still standing. Well, um, again, I want to thank you both um, for an engaging, thought-provoking uh, conversation. Um, I think that Debbie has collected some questions um, from the audience for you to consider. I'm going to toss it back over to Debbie. Thank you, Norval, and thank you so much, Stanley and Heather, for this um, really invigorating and critical, critical discussion um, on, on prison reform more generally and, and the events that happen in Attica more specifically. Um, I do hope that other people will add some questions to the chat because we have um, about 15 minutes left to, to answer your questions. But to get us started, Millie asks, is there any meaningful help or treatment being provided to address the trauma the survivors or the brothers still deal with? So Stanley, 
maybe you can start off with that answering that question. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's really a question for Heather. You know, one of the things that, that we've done was at the premiere, we did um, provide a, a, a psychiatrist who, who was available to talk to the brothers and, and anybody else who needed to talk to, to somebody. And, you know, the, the images of the film are, are really, really powerful. And, and I, I, I can't even imagine how, you know, um, they affect uh, the brothers and the people who, who actually were there. Um, a bunch of the brothers who were in the film were actually shot. Uh, all of them were gassed. Um, so um, that that was one of the things that we did. And also, you know, beforehand, um, we had a meeting where the uh, uh, psych psychiatrist was, was available and, and led the meeting and, and talked to them about uh, what they were feeling and what they were going to see. Yeah, I think that Stanley's, what Stanley's team is, what did was just incredible. I mean, they were very, very, very careful and conscious of, of that exact question, right? How do, you, how do you deal with people's trauma as you were asking them to walk through this kind of pain? My process was a, a lot more dragged out. I mean, 13 years of talking to people over a long time, like for example, I, you know, one of the brothers in the film you know, I was so struck in the film watching him now talk about it versus, you know, I talked to him, I think it was like 2004, the first time I talked to him. And, and you know, people have lived with this for a very, very long time. And so my relationships with a lot of these people were of a much longer duration. And, you know, that, that has a different kind of tenor to it. You know, you, you just kind of, you, you tend to know people's families over time and you kind of tend to in and out of their lives in different ways over time. But, you know, it, 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 I have often worried, you know, a lot about that. Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? How do you make sure you're there for people? And how do you make sure that you're not exploiting people? And how do you make sure that you're listening to people and not putting words in their mouth and making sure that you're, in my case, writing about violence without making, making it, uh, you know, gratuitous or, or, you know, how do you do that? And I think it's an ongoing self-reflective process. And I have to say that what's, you know, bringing therapists, doing all that, I mean, this is, it's really incredible. I, I really was in awe of how their team handled it. Yeah, thank you so much for those, um, those responses. I think it's so critical um, in, in making sure that the brothers, you know, are able to relive some of these memories um, with the support that, that uh, with professional support as long as, as well as each other. Um, Amada has a question. I feel a majority of the time when discussing prison reform, it can tend to be male centered and the issues women in prison face can be on the back burner. Menstrual issues coming from homes with domestic violence, sexual trauma, leaving their children behind, et cetera. How can Attica and Blood in the Water be extended as a tool to amplify the issues women also face in prison? Heather? <laughs> well, I mean, it, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Attica story, and it's, it's not so evident in the actual four or five days of the actual uprising, but the Attica story is a very, uh, it's actually a, a, a very female-centered story in, in so many ways. The fight for justice in particular that goes on, that goes on for decades is very much led by women. And it is a story that is very much grounded and also in the experience of women on the inside. So it's, it is interesting how even though it's, it's set in a, in a in a male prison, the, the actual story is, is actually not as male-centered as you would think. And I think that the, the lessons learned about Attica are absolutely applicable to every institution. And um, because it's about fundamental human rights and it's about dignity and whether you're talking about uh, the loss of children, you're talking about you know, body integrity, whether you're talking about abuse from guards, whatever you're talking about, uh, I think it is really important to extrapolate from Attica to the broader point, which is about uh, you know, resisting that kind of abuse and resisting that kind of absolute subjugation 
uh, at the hands of state actors. And, 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 it, and one needs to do it deliberately because I do think that there is this tendency with all prison reform discussions and all discussions about prisons to always think about man, men and male prisoners. In the state where I am, there's only one institution, well, thank God there's only one institution, but because there is only one institution where women are incarcerated, you know, it's as if they don't exist at all. So I'm, I'm very, very sensitive to this. You always have to kind of like, no, actually, their experiences are just as, as brutal and you have to make them connect those dots constantly. So Stanley, Dwayne has a question for you. Um, are there any pressures that the makers of this kind of film face that viewers like himself might be unaware of? You know, are there people who don't want this kind of movie to exist? And so what were you dealing with in that respect? I'm not really, not yet. <laughs> you know, I, I, again, the film's been shown four times. You know, um, one of one is one of the times was in Toronto. So, um, so I, I, I don't, I don't really know. You know, um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. You know, um, but it, it, on, on the other hand, you know, um, one of the things that that, uh, that that's happening in the documentary world, you know, is is there, there's so many kind of services, streaming services, you know, Showtime. HBO, Netflix, Hulu, um, that that there's a, a real push for content in the end. And so many times these people just look at it as as content, you know. Um, I'm not sure how much Showtime is interested in prison reform, um, but but they're interested in, you know, a, a, a well-told story, um, an exciting story, and a story that that informs people. And and so that if if we can if we can meet those needs of the broadcaster but also do something else that we want to do, you know, is try to, is try to use film uh, for change. That, that's what, what we're trying to do, you know, at Firelight. Then, you know, um, then, then we meet uh, both of those ends. But no, not yet. I mean, there hasn't been any um, kind of pushback. But, you know, we're not, we're not Hollywood and we're not, you know, we, we don't announce, oh, you know, um, a, you know, a, a film is being made about Attica starring Denzel Washington and Brad Pitt. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't announce it. Um, you know, we're just making the film, and and so we'll see what happens. At, you know, as as the state and authorities and you know the prison guards. You know, which are incredible unions. You know, I mean the prison guard. You know, I remember years ago reading that. Uh, you know, the prison prison guards in, in California had the largest. Um, union, most powerful union in the state, you know, so we'll see what happens. How about, how about you, Heather? Um, in the, you know, release of your book, did you face any backlash or pressure, anything of that sort? I mean, I actually did, but it was not so much the, the telling of the, the, the uprising itself. It was more of the, 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 the subsequent three, two sections, three sections of the book. It's really about the cover up of what happens afterwards. Um, I named the shooters or several of the shooters that had been protected for 45 years and that generated enormous controversy that members of law enforcement that had uh, actually killed people in the yard and um, got a lot of uh, that generated as you might imagine a lot of uh, uh, flack and also really laying a lot of this blame at the, the feet of the Rockefeller administration and at the, the feet of a lot of the very specific uh, specific people, specific prosecutors, specific lawyers, and really kind of lifting the veil on just how really uh, ugly the cover-up was, uh, right down to uh, splicing film, disappearing photographs, letting people uh, retire, um, giving people immunity, um, not indicting uh, police officers who they absolutely knew who had shot whom and who had uh, tortured whom. And um, so that was a, a kind of separate part of the actual thing. And, and, and it remains a controversy. It's one of the reasons why, in my view, the records still are not open. There is no statute of limitations on murder. There is no, um, you know, the, the, the police union is still deeply, deeply invested in keeping these records closed. Um, which brings us to the next question uh, from Amy, who says, with half of this country wanting to be lied to and, the, and deny that critical race theory or however it's been co-opted um, 
be used uh, and the systemic racism, racism of this country and just not wanting to hear or know about any of this, are we headed towards another civil war? For those of us that have been fighting for justice and human rights since the 60s and 70s and see how much worse it has gotten in spite of everyone's efforts, including your efforts, it is demoralizing to see what human beings do to each other and are okay with it. So what is it gonna take to change? Um, I, you know, I, I, I hope that we're not headed towards a civil war, no one, no one knows, you know, but, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, we have to keep pushing for change. You know, we have to keep working for change. We have to keep doing it, you know, with a positive attitude, you know. Um, you know, we're, we're going to go through ups and downs, but, but, but we'll win, you know. You know, change will happen. You know, change will happen. But, you know, we can't get demoralized or, or, or we, we can't get, uh, you know, we can't, we can't get evil. We got, we've got we've to gotta keep working and, and keep pushing. I agree with that. And I think that a historian in me would say that, you know, we, 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 we forget that, you know, even a long time ago, 30%, there's always been 30% of the population actually that was, you know, suspicious of vaccines, whether it was polio, whether it was whooping cough, didn't want fluoride in the water. That's why there is, you know, entire, entire counties still around the country that still don't have fluoride in the water. We've always had you know, the lunatic fringe, we've always had the crazies. The difference is that they are, you know, technology has amplified their voices. Technology has made it seem a lot bigger than it is. But what is remarkable is if you look at last summer, if you look at George Floyd's summer, what actually is new is that more people turned out, more young people, old people, a, a more multiracial, multi-generational a uh, group of people turned out in the street uh, on behalf, uh, actually, of uh, uh, racial justice and against police violence than actually has ever happened in American history. And this is coming from someone who knows the 60s pretty damn well and 1968 pretty damn well. And so actually the 30% of the, the lunatics is not new, but that actually is new. So that gives me some measure of hope, actually, for what it's worth. Oh, that's, um, I think we both need, we all need to, to keep that hope alive um, in order to move forward. Um, and so this, this leads to Tamiris's question, which you've sort of answered along the way, but I would just want to reiterate it. What is the importance of telling the horrors of the past and trying to solve the present issues in society? Um, I mean, it's a cliche, but, you know, we've got to know where we've been to, you know, map out a new way to go. I, mean, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I try to do, you know, with films is, is to make films that have relevance to today, you know, um, even though the um, uh, majority of my work is historical, but I, I think, think they have, it has relevance to today and, um, I think that certainly Attica has a lot of relevance. Mm -hmm. And people learn in different ways. You know, I think that people learn, some, some people learn by reading, but, but most people actually learn visually. And, and that's why Stanley's films are such an inc incredible gift. If we, don't, if, if we don't have a generation that knows, that knows that, that standing up to injustice is not only uh, possible but but preferable and honorable and and not the work of uh of um you know just dreamers or that you don't have to you know be these kind of these iconic figures that nobody could possibly live up to like not everybody was this sort of mythical you know martin luther king figure if we don't have stories about you know frankly incarcerated people standing up for justice that are honorable people, then you're asking a younger generation uh, to be what? To, to all imagine themselves as Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, it would be insane to imagine a future in their hands because nobody could possibly be that person. So, so these stories are important to, to empower young people, to imagine them just being themselves and taking the, the generations forward. Absolutely, so critical. Um, so we're almost out of time, but just two more questions. 
One from Shana, have any of the former prisoners shared their thoughts on prison abolition and on the present prison reform movement? They're pretty radical. <laughs> they, yeah, I'd say. What, what about you, Stanley? What have you heard? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously, you know, um, for, for, for their experience as prisoners, you know, besides Attica, but also their, their um, experience as, as just prisoners, you know, they're, they're definitely in favor of change. Yeah. But would you go, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that most people absolutely who've been, anyone who's been on the inside knows that the system is an utter and complete failure and needs to be torn down at its, at, you know, root and branch. But I think that, that you know, one of the different sensitivities that folks on the inside have, and I think folks on the outside, you know, you know, they're, they're very eager to remind people on the outside is that while that is the goal, that you know, it is also really, really important to also fight for change in the moment as well, because there's a whole lot of people suffering right now in this moment on the inside and that, you know, things that look pretty mundane in this moment to fight for uh, are lifelines to people in this moment right now. And, and so you hear both, you know, you hear a lot of advocacy for what feels like pretty mundane reforms in the moment, uh, pretty passionately because people are very aware of how desolate and desperate people are in the moment, but also in unequivocal condemnation of this as anything other than a complete failure that needs to be rooted out 100%. And, you know, it, it is a failure. It must be, it must be ended. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and last question for Stanley. Uh, this. This film is gonna be shown on Showtime, I believe, right? Uh, starting on November 6th. Can you remind us also where we where they can see it in theaters? Uh, oh, yeah, so so it, it's at the Cinema Village um, in, in New York um, on 12th Street starting uh, the 29th. So it's uh, next Friday, uh, October 29th, and it's, it's playing there for a week yet. You'll have to get to the theater for, for Showtime. But that's a premiere, and um, again, uh, Tracy Curry and myself will be there um, uh, next Friday, and then hopefully Saturday and Sunday uh, at the evening screenings uh, to also talk about the film. Please come out. I think it's uh, you know it's great. It's good. It's going to be great on Showtime. It's great that that it's reaching that that audience. But to see the film on the big screen is just unbelievable. Um, so please, uh, if, if you can, again uh, next Friday the 29th at Cinema Village. And I would encourage all of you to see it in person. Um, Norval and I got the privilege of seeing it at the Apollo last week. Um, and it was really, really powerful to not only see it on the big screen, but also to see Stanley, <coughs> director Tracy Curry, um, the brothers. Um, it, was, it was incredibly powerful to see it with, yeah. with that group of people. So I hope that all of you can go in person but if not it'll be on showtime um so stanley heather and norval thank you so so much for taking the time to be with us and to share um a bit about your work and uh this critical issue that maybe not that many of us in the audience knew much about um but is so relevant to what we're still talking about today so thank you so much and stanley hopefully one of these days you can come back to campus um, I know you're not too far away and we'd love to I'm, have I'm, you in I'm, person. I'm, I'm three blocks away. So anytime. Um, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank for, you, Stanley. So and, and, thank you, and thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, City College, you know, for, for, for everything that, that uh, you know, City College has given me everything that, that I have, given me the ability to make films. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye, everybody.